There we go. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Kevin Polito. I'm the Neighborhood Affairs Manager with the City of Miami Beach. Um, this evening, we're going to go ahead and begin our Mooring Field virtual public meeting. Um, and I do want to recognize um, some of the elected officials that we have on the call this evening. Um, so first, we do have Commissioner Ricky Ariola. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we have Commissioner Stephen Miner. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, and let me just quickly go through um, our attendee list to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Perfect. So um, this evening, you're going to be hearing from the City of Miami Beach. Uh, we have Miss. Uh, Amy Knowles, our Chief Resiliency Officer, as well as our Assistant City Manager, Lester Sola. Uh, we have our Director of Capital Improvement Projects, Mr. David Martinez, as well as the Division Director, uh, Maria Serna. And then we do have um, the team uh, of our consultants, which Amy is going to introduce in just a moment. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over uh, to Mr. Lester Sola, who's going to give us some opening remarks. Thank you, Kevin. And, and for us, it's really a pleasure to, to come before the, the, the city residents, right, and, and, and our elected officials and talk about how this project continues to, to move forward. And part of the progress going forward is making sure that our residents are informed as to every time that there's a decision point that needs to be made, and we want to hear from the public. So with, for us, you mentioned we have not just city professionals that are here tonight, but also we have some professionals that the city has hired to assist us in this process. So we wanna make sure that we go through this presentation, tell the residents where we're at, where we're headed, and then offer an opportunity for some questions and answers that we'll be able to answer any questions that they may have towards the end. As part of the team, you mentioned Amy Knowles, who's our Chief Resiliency Officer. She also serving as the Interim Environment and Sustainability Director, as well as Lindsay Perch, who's Environmental Resource Manager, and from the, obviously from the city who will be doing some of the presentations. We're also, it's important also to also mention David Martinez, who is the director of the Office of Capital Improvement, as well as his staff, Maria Serna, who's a division director. And these are the individuals who will be involved when it gets to the construction phase of the project who will take on that leadership role. And as a resource to the city, we have Nadia Laki, which is also a professional engineer, just like David. Uh, with Senior Associate in eSciences, which is a co company, a consulting company that provides resources and support services to the city, as well as Tim Blankenship, who also provides uh, services as well from Moffat and Nichols. And I will go ahead and int introduce Amy. Hey, well, good evening, and thank you so much, Lester. Good evening, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I have been with the city for about six years now, um, and most recently serving as your Chief Resilience Officer. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure also serving as your Interim Environment and Sustainability Director, because um, I get to work on really interesting projects like this, and uh, about 10 years of my career was spent uh, working on environmental and sustainability um, items, so it's, it's a nice fit. Um, so our purpose tonight, um, just to, to make sure that we're all kind of um, level set on why we're here and uh, what we're trying to achieve, is to provide a status update on the proposed regulated mooring field. Uh, we want to make sure that the community is advised as we, as we move from preliminary analysis to design and permitting. We want to make sure you're updated and that you have a lot of opportunity for feedback. So we will focus on the status, we will focus on the progress, and we will focus on some of the next steps. And then we also would like to, of course, listen and answer any questions. In terms of the actual agenda on the next slide, um, I'm going to be covering the actual city steps to date. Um, I will review some new state legislation um, that's been passed about that counties can actually establish anchoring limitation areas called ALAs. We're going to provide a little bit about that. Our consultants will provide an overview of a preliminary analysis and more specifically the different areas that are being considered. We'll talk a little bit about the next steps, um, some frequently asked questions. Many of you have sent in already. Thank you very much. So we are well prepared to respond to those and then allow some time for public comment. So we wanted to level set just a little bit and talk about um, why a regulated mooring field. We do realize that there may be many people on the line that maybe haven't been involved in this in the past couple of years. I know that this, uh, this uh, meeting was spread very widely and we appreciate that. So the biggest reason um, is that there's been a, a major increase in vessels um, 
on the west side of Miami Beach. Uh, primarily, there are concerns about safety, about boater safety, there are concerns about derelict vessels, and there are significant environmental concerns. Um, anchor dragging is currently disturbing sensitive seagrass, and we know um, from a, a citywide and countywide perspective, there's a lot of major concerns about our seagrass habitat um, in Biscayne Bay. Having a regulated mooring field could do some positive things. Um, one, we can actually control the density of anchorage, the amount of boats that are allowed to be there. Um, we can increase public safety by making sure that we know who the mooring field users are. Um, navigational safety will be improved. Um, we can protect maritime infrastructure and property by having secure moorings. Um, this is actually an asset that the city could have to our local economy by attracting users. Um, it also designates an area so that there's a buffer between waterfront properties and the anchorage. And then it also helps with water quality uh, for a couple of ways. One, requiring sewage pump outs and preventing pollution from oil and gasoline spills that can happen. And finally, the city can establish an ordinance to establish, uh, to regulate user behaviors through our own ordinance in the city. Next slide. And what is a regulated mooring field? Um, so this would be a legally defined area within a body of water. We're specifically referring to Biscayne Bay in this, in this um, evening presentation. It would be established by local ordinance. A mooring field does require a management plan um, to regulate the vessels and activity. And that management plan actually comes pretty early on in the design and permitting process. Um, customers would be assigned a mooring and, a, and secure a boat to a permanently anchored buoy. And again, this is an organized and a secure way to protect both the boats and the environment. It also includes support facilities that can be on land. Typically this incorporates a dinghy dock and a sewage pump out and dock. Um, those are the two uh, requirements, if you will, the dinghy dock and the sewage pump out. Um, and additionally, there are often upland assets that are associated with mooring fields, such as parking, uh, restrooms, showers, potable water sources, and a harbor master, though those are not required. The next slide, we have some, uh, some pictures provided uh, just about some of the issues that we see from um, existing conditions and the negative impacts. Um, so these are just a few of the boats within the Sunset Harbor derelict vessels. Um, and again, this, this unregulated mooring causes a lot of damage. Um, it's extremely expensive, about $30,000 to um, address some of these derelict vessels. And then there's opportunities for um, boater safety issues, sunken vessels, water quality impacts, oil, gas, and sewage discharge. Navigational issues, very um, obvious here. Um, lots of accidents can happen. So this is happening and um, a serious concern that we wanna try to avoid through establishing the mooring field. Thank you, Kevin. The next slide is going to share a little bit about um, the increasing amount of unregulated anchorage that is happening. Um, the image you see on the left is an aerial from January of 2003, where it shows about 51 moorings. And the image on the right, December from 2018, shows 74 moorings. So the cumulative effect of unregulated mooring does include damage. Um, it does include anchor dragging and water quality issues. And so by regulating, we can really better spread these um, boats out. We can make sure that they're highly regulated and that there can be some order um, to this as well. And next slide. This is an example of a couple of mooring fields. I'm sure many of you on the line are very familiar, um, but we don't have one on Miami Beach. However, they are um, all over the state of Florida. There are others throughout Miami-Dade County. A couple of pictures that just shows um, what better regulations can do. On the photo on the left, you're seeing a more sort of densely organized mooring field um, in Coconut Grove. Um, the city of Miami is actually pursuing different mooring fields um, and one specifically in Watson Island, which does um, let us know that we may be seeing more unregulated boats being shifted to Miami Beach. So that is important to note. Um, and then the, the image on the right shows a mooring field in Sarasota different, you know, less dense, more spread out, less populated. So just showing some of the variation and the types of mooring fields um, that we have in the state. So some of the city steps that have been taking to establish a mooring field. Um, back in 2014, the Blue Ways Master Plan did identify potential locations for mooring fields. Um, and, and the one that uh, we've done preliminary analysis on is included in that. 
Um, in, in March of 2019, um, uh, Commissioner Ariola did refer a discussion to the Finance Committee regarding the Marine and Waterfront Protection Authority's recommendation to explore a mooring field. So there has been considerable work done um, in the past to move this forward. The administration was directed to move forward and evaluate the viability of establishing a mooring field in Sunset Harbor. Um, the city did contract with eScience's um, and Moffat and Nickel to help develop that analysis. Um, there was a public meeting in February of 2020. A uh, presentation was provided at the Finance Committee. And um, because of some of the feedback that, that was received, there was a recommendation to consider extending the proposed mooring field um, more, towards South, uh, more towards South Beach along West Avenue towards Fifth Street, understanding that there's concerns and needs for upland facilities as well. And then um, what we're really excited about is in November of 2021, we did receive a grant um, just a couple months ago from the Florida Inland Navigation District find um, to help us fund the cost of design and permitting. So that's very exciting. Um, we are uh, excited to, to start this phase of design and permitting, which is why we are having this meeting tonight. On the next slide, we wanted to share some new information uh, that came about in 2021. Um, there was a, a Senate bill that was passed and a new state statute to address um, anchoring limitations in state waters. Um, so there are concerns about unauthorized anchoring within city limits that establishing a mooring field could actually shift um, these boats to other areas that currently don't have them. So this new state statute would allow the county, that's Miami-Dade County, to establish limitations to prevent overnight mooring in certain areas, in defined areas. So we do think that the mooring field, um, in order to address these concerns, it would be important to work very closely with the county to establish overnight mooring areas. Uh, we'll also need to work very closely with uh, the city's marine patrol to understand the areas of most concern and why, so that the best information can be provided as we do that. Um, so here is the information. We will also be including this on a, on a website that we will show you. Um, but in the statute, there are already three grandfathered anchoring limitation areas that prevent overnight mooring on um, Sunset Lake between Rivo Aldo Island and Delito Island between San Marino and San Marco. And just note again, this is uh, there are specific uh, parameters within within this item um, It is restricted to certain urban areas that have residential docking facilities and significant boat traffic. Uh, they cannot exceed more than 10% of a county's delineated navigable, in fact, not waterways. And um, they must be less than 100 acres in size and they have to provide notice and uh, through waterway markers and buoys. Next slide. I wanna talk a little bit about the next steps from our city staff perspective before I hand it over to our consultant. Um, the first and most important next step is to obtain consensus on location um, from our city commission. In order for us to begin design and permitting, we need to have a defined geographic uh, boundaries. So we would then begin design and permitting, which are parallel processes, and that's something our consultants would help us with. As part of that, we would develop a management plan that would include the dinghy dock for shore access and pump out requirements as well as any upland facilities, if that is uh, deemed the direction. Step three, we need to establish a city mooring field ordinance, and there are very good examples of how to do that. And step four is to really address concerns for an unregulated anchoring moving to other areas of the city and requesting the county to establish um, this areas that I had just covered. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to our consultants, I believe to Nadia, to talk a little bit about the options that we have for phasing considerations. Um, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so as Amy indicated, it's been almost two years since we presented the findings of the preliminary analysis to you uh, at a public meeting. And this evening, uh, we're going to focus on the next step. One of the important next steps is for the city to determine how they want to phase this and sequence the mooring field. Amy talked about the location. And so that's important as well as um, where we start with the permitting and the design. So this graphic is from our study and it shows four different potential phases of the project. Uh, the study considered this larger area for the conceptual layouts with the understanding that, you know, future studies would determine the actual extent of the mooring field. Uh, each area outlined space for 50 anchors with a mix of 
different vessel sizes, but the more the mooring field phasing layouts, the navigational constraints, and all of that will be further developed by the city uh, with input from the community and um, additional studies. It'll be important to note that the city can determine the density of the anchoring in the area so they can space the moorings out more or less uh, in order to reduce the number of boats allowed in the area. Amy showed two examples of a mooring field aerial photo where um, there was, you know, the, the, the density was uh, sort of maximized and then also uh, an aerial photo that showed the boats more spaced out. So the city has uh, leeway uh, in order to consider how they want to, um, the density of the moorings. So some of the considerations include how the phasing would impact the permitting. Uh, the city may elect to permit the entire area or permit one or more phases and then obtain permits for additional phases. If the city elects to permit all of the areas concurrently, they can still build them in phases and permitting them all can reduce the overall time and effort associated with the permitting efforts. However, one of the considerations is that it's possible that more seagrass mitigation requirements uh, may be imposed by the regulatory agencies. Um, permitting an initial phase, on the other hand, can help the city assess the demands for future phasing after an initial area is established by seeing where the boats will anchor after the regulated uh, area becomes, reg one area becomes regulated and use that information to determine the next phase uh, to be designed and permitted. Next slide, please. So if the city elects to permit initial phase, an initial phase or initial phases, they need to decide where to start. One of the bigger considerations in permitting the areas with the most regulated mooring um, is that permitting the areas with the most regulated mooring establishes the need for a mooring field. And establishing a need is one of the things we have to demonstrate to the permitting agencies. So it does make it easier for us to justify the need for uh, the, per the mooring field to the agencies when there's already unregulated anchoring in those areas. And that's over to, to the north. Uh, secondly, we anticipate that seagrass mitigation would not be required in those areas because of the environmental benefits. So for example, Installing permanent anchors would reduce the physical impacts to the seagrass by eliminating the anchor setting and the anchor dragging. And requiring sewage pump out would improve water quality, which also improves seagrass growth. So it's sort of those, that area we can justify that uh, the installing the anchors is sort of self-mitigating for seagrass. The areas to the south don't have as much unregulated mooring, uh, so the environmental benefits initially uh, are less, but um, we do uh, expect some seagrass mitigation uh, for some of those to be required as some of those, um, for some of those Southern areas, if permitting were started in that area. Another consideration is that the city owns the submerged lands in front of Maurice Gibb Park already. In order to get a permit, uh, the, then the rest of the area is owned by the state. So in order to get the permits from the state, uh, there will have to be a lease uh, put into place of a lease of the submerged lands that matches the outline of the mooring fields. And finally, uh, there's the area's proximity to land-based facilities that are accessible by boat. Uh, northern areas uh, are closer to the Maurice Skid Park, and the southern areas are closer to the Miami Beach Marina, as you can see those on the, on the map. And um, I will now turn it over to Tim Blankenship. He's going to discuss a little bit about the upland facilities and the design process. And then I'll discuss the permitting process. Okay, great. Thank you, Nadia. Next slide, please. Okay, on the design phase, one of the concerns we heard from the previous public workshop on this project were what type of upland facilities are required? Can the, can the mooring field just exist on its own without any upland support? The regulatory permits only have two major requirements. One is a digging dock for the boaters that are utilizing, the, the marina customers that are utilizing the mooring field to access the upland facility. 
The second item is a, uh, the second requirement is a sewage pump out facility. Uh, that can be a land-based pump out, a permanent uh, pump out that you see at uh, fuel docks and other marinas, or a lot of managed mooring fields in Florida also utilize a, a, a pump out boat, which is a portable system. The boat just comes and services the various vessels uh, upon request. Um, both the land-based pump out and the sewage pump out boat uh, there's quite a few grants that are available to uh, fund those um, those services. Those are really the only two um, requirements that are from regulatory permits uh, that are that are going to be have to be presented in the environmental permitting process. Other facilities, uh, other we kind of consider them as amenities, uh, such as parking um, and uh, a harbor master office, uh, restrooms, uh, that kind of thing. Next slide, please. So in the design phase, as Nadia mentioned and Amy discussed, uh, the, the phasing, you know, where the city wants to start, whether it's in the north or the south area, uh, needs to be decided. Uh, the next part, the next component would be the development of a management plan. Uh, what are going to be the rules and regulations? Um, what are going to be the requirements of the customers? Um, the operations and maintenance of the facility? Uh, a development management plan has to be uh, put together based on the design and based on the uh, planned operation uh, of the facility. Uh, last or thirdly, the mooring field layout needs to be uh, established. This includes allowance for navigation channels, uh, buffers, from the cha uh, buffers from the adjacent shorelines. Uh, this is dependent on the water depths that are there and the geometry, the figure on the right shows a typical uh, modern mooring ball where you have a helical anchor that goes into the seabed. Um, there's a kind of a shock absorber system then that we call a downline that connects to the mooring ball where the boat actually um, secures to. So uh, that is swings on a radius, which is dependent on the predominant winds, waves, currents uh, that are affecting the vessels um, while they're anchored. So there, there's kind of an exercise in, in geometry where we determine the number of anchors. Uh, the size of the anchoring systems based on the vessels uh, that we anticipate for the mooring field to accommodate, you know, whether it's a, a 30 foot long vessel or a 60 foot long vessel. Um, all that has to be outlined uh, within the geometry uh, of the desired managed mooring field size. Uh, then we have to develop the layout of the dinghy dock. Uh, how many how many vessels do we anticipate utilizing the dinghy dock? Where is the dinghy dock going to be located? Um, ideally, the dinghy dock would be conveniently located to um, to the mooring field because a lot of uh, vessels actually they don't have motors that they have a little electric motors. Uh, so sometimes having a, a long distance between your dinghy dock and to and and to the upland facility support can can be a concern. Uh, some managed mooring fields actually have a shuttle boat that services uh, the managed mooring field. Uh, lastly, the specifications for the buoys and the signage, the um, managed mooring field actually needs to be physically marked with uh, marker buoys. And this that also helps the Marine Patrol uh, enforce the rules and regulations of the managed mooring field. And then any upland support facilities would need to be determined uh, the location and the amount of facilities, the minimum requirements, requirements we discussed and then potential uh, additional amenities. That's it on the design phase. Next slide. Thank you, Tim. You, Nadia. Okay. So Tim discussed how the, the design process, which as Amy indicated, will run concurrently with the permitting process. So when we permit projects like this, it's, it's very ordinary for us to collaborate and determine what information is needed together. At this time, the studies that we anticipate that we would need are, are listed uh, in front of you right now. Firstly is a, a seagrass survey of the area to be determined um, to, that was necessary to, for the permitting uh, to determine if there is uh, the presence of seagrass and um, any mitigation requirements that uh, the agencies may want to uh, impose on the city. And um, this has to be completed during the optimal seagrass growing season, which is established by the agencies as being June to September each year. There will also be uh, an underwater survey that's focused on identifying submerged debris that could present hazards that would need to be removed in order to uh, safely construct and operate uh, the regulated mooring field. 
A bathymetric survey would also need to be conducted, and that type of survey maps the depths of the land of the submerged lands as well as the curvature of the bottom of the of the bay. And finally, a licensed surveyor would be needed to prepare a land survey of the boundaries of the mooring field and develop a legal description of the area. I mentioned the submerged land lease uh, earlier, uh, so we have to establish the legal boundaries of the area that's going to be uh, permitted as a mooring field. And that's what the, the purpose of the land survey and the legal description is. So um, then moving on to permitting, we'll sit together with the permitting agencies and discuss the uh, preliminary design concept and get their feedback early in the process. There's um, some acronyms here. Uh, that's the United States Coast Guard, the United States Army Corps of Engineers, the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, and Miami-Dade County's uh, Department of Regulatory and Economic Resources. So um, we the, the city requires permits from all of those agencies for the mooring field. They all have different requirements related to navigation as well as environmental um, issues. And um, there are several uh, consulting agencies that they will consult with as well uh, on top of the uh, those agencies, other agencies will be involved. So we typically hold a pre-application meeting with each of the agencies to discuss a preliminary design concept. And that's very helpful to get their feedback early in the permitting pro and design process um, because the agencies become aware of the project and we can pick up the phone and, and, and speak to them throughout the process. But also they often come up with some um, ideas, uh, some feedback about things to watch out for, or maybe some features of the design that may be able to be modified in order to streamline permitting um, and other helpful information. And it's, um, several of them actually do come out and dive the area and want to look at the, the, the area in the field. Uh, and um, that's sort of a second uh, pre-application meeting. So uh, once the 30% design is complete, um, we uh, submit the permit applications to the agencies concurrently. Um, it's a separate application for each uh, agency, and that starts the permitting pro permit processing stage. Uh, the agencies will collaborate with those other agencies that we mentioned that are non-permitting agencies but are commenting agencies, uh, such as the National Marine Fisheries Service, that is a part of NOAA. Um, and this can result in additional meetings, but it always results in additional requests for additional uh, information. Um, that can um, include revisions to requested revisions to the design, uh, requested revisions or additional information related to mitigation plans, clarifying other information uh, and other items. So uh, we typically get a request for additional information from each agency as part of the permitting process. That's an ordinary part. Um, but uh, once we work through the individual requirements for each permitting agency and the project is approved by the agency in concept, then there's a public noticing process where the public has an opportunity to provide comments. Um, during that time, the agencies are, DEP specifically, will be working on um, a submerged lands lease. Um, and these permit approvals go all the way up to the governor at the state level and then also at the county level to the Board of County Commissioners before the permits are issued. Next slide, please. And just to bring it all together, uh, and once the city, you know, and on this slide uh, and what the timeline is and the process is to sort of simplify things, once the city establishes the location and phasing of the mooring field, uh, they'll identify anchoring limitation areas that are desirable to the city. And after that, um, we will know the areas that need to be studied. And so the studies that I mentioned will be conducted. We anticipate it would be summer before the design and permitting phase will, will occur. And the design and permitting for a project like this takes 18 to 24 months. And one of the reasons that this takes so long is because of the consultation with the outside agencies. Uh, I mentioned the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, in particular their consultation is a very lengthy process that's outside of the city's control. And um, we have in here that the city also intends to pursue additional grant funding for the project, and that'll be pursued uh, concurrently with the permitting. 
So with that, I will turn the presentation back over to the city. Okay, so thank you so much, Nadia and Tim. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the frequently asked questions that we have heard um, in hopes that this will um, help some of the questions that uh, we might get from you. Uh, we are also gonna be posting a three page frequently asked questions online. Um, we had many more that we probably won't get to tonight. Um, so the first question is why did the city request a feasibility study in the specific proposed areas? Uh, the answer is there's been a significant increase in the amount of anchoring of vessels in the area around the Venetian Causeway and Sunset Harbor. The city's received concerns from residents and neighborhoods regarding this unregulated anchorage. And we're also concerned about the impacts to Biscayne Bay environmentally from anchors and potential discharges. Question two, why is a mooring field important? Um, it basically just eliminates this unregulated anchoring of vessels. Um, boaters can access mooring balls and therefore not be able to randomly anchor. Um, boaters will need to abide by the rules and regulations of the mooring field, including sewage pump out, along with support facilities for dinghies or perhaps a, a shuttle boat. The managed mooring field will also significantly reduce the, dere the derelict vessels in the area, and it will also help Marine Patrol with its enforcement capabilities. Um, third, how are the areas, uh, potential areas selected? Um, again, there's just a history and growth in these areas. Um, in addition, the city does own a portion of the submerged lands near Maurice Gibb Park, which could make permitting easier. Um, and input was provided from the city's um, Marine Patrol group. For the environmental benefits, um, there has been a substantial loss of seagrass habitat as reported by state and local environmental agencies. This will help protect the seagrass beds by eliminating the unregulated and random anchoring and the anchor dragging. Um, it also is intended to reduce the density of moored vessels and those enforceable rules and regulations that I already mentioned. Um, five, how will the facilities be managed? Um, the city administration and the Finance and Economic Resilience Committee um, did recommend um, more southernmost areas potentially because it is closer to upland facilities that may be available. Um, the environmental regulatory permitting process has minimum requirements um, that would include the dinghy dock and sewage pump out, but other upland support facilities that would be considered amenities um, are not required, um, but that, that is an additional consideration. Um, at this point, there are no formal agreements with any potential marina operators or uh, mooring operators at this time. That will be determined as we get to the management plan portion of the design and permitting phase. Um, where will the revenue go and what will the fees be? Um, again, this has not quite yet been determined and it will be and is required to be as part of the management plan. And uh, number seven, how will the city pursue unregulated anchoring following the establishment of a mooring field? And how will the regulated mooring field impact navigational channel, channels and property buffers? Um, so with that, the, um, you know, the, the feasibility and the new state statute that allows the counties to establish anchoring limitations will really help. Uh, we think that that will be helpful. Um, there are buffer zones um, about 100 feet from the mooring field. There's no unregulated um, mooring. And uh, we feel that that is something that will have to be part of the management plan and will help address some of those issues. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Kevin. Great, thank you so much, Amy. Um, so I do wanna recognize, uh, we do have Vice Mayor David Richardson. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, uh, as well as his aide, uh, Mr. Luis Cajaya. So I thank you both uh, for joining us. Um, now we're gonna go into uh, questions and answers. Uh, so for those of you who have any questions or, or just comments, uh, please raise your hand via Zoom at this time. Um, on the screen now, you could, if you're participating on your mobile device, you could visit mbrisingabove.com slash mooring. That's where you're going to find tonight's uh, recording will be there as well as the presentation you saw. Um, if you are watching on a laptop, you could scan the QR code and it will take you there. But again, the FAQs that Amy mentioned, as well as the video will be uploaded tomorrow. Uh, so just some quick ground rules uh, for our Q&A. We're going to do two minutes per person. I, I do ask 
We have over 100 people on the line this evening. So I do ask, please try to keep your comments within two minutes. Uh, we're going to try to get through everybody as quickly as we can. Unfortunately, I'm sorry in advance if I do mute you uh, halfway through your comments. Uh, if you're participating on your phone and you would like to raise your hand, you should have an option at the bottom that says raise hand. If not, there are three dots. You click the dots, then you'll see the raise your hand feature. Um, and if you're participating by calling in, you click star nine. Uh, to go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, everyone who's calling this evening, uh, please state your name and your address. Um, and we're going to go ahead and get into it. Uh, we do have a hard stop this evening at 730. So I just want to make sure everyone's avail uh, aware of our hard stop. And again, we're going to try to go through two minutes per person and see um, how many people we can get to. If your questions are not answered, you could go on our website again, which is MiamiMBRisingAbove.com slash Maureen, where you could, or you could email me your question. I'll make sure the team gets to it. Okay, so we'll go ahead and start. Our first caller is Harry Blake. If you could state your full name and address. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes, yeah, so my name is Harry Blake. Uh, my address is 1491 Lincoln Terrace. Um, I'm the owner of uh, the unit there. Um, so first, I'd like to say, as an owner, I am completely for this if this replaces the free-for-all that we currently have in place. I've been hoping for this for years. Um, that being said, I do have a couple of questions. Um, is this mooring field going to be full-time or transient only? Um, if it is full-time, is there a preference for Miami Beach residents to get a mooring ball? And uh, what would the liveaboard status be? Great. Thank you, Mr. Blake. So I'm going to turn that over to our team uh, to answer your questions. Um, so I think we could go to uh, maybe Nydia there. Okay. So um, I believe that the, um, the that that's one of the things that the city needs to work through as we go through the management plan process as to um, uh, whether they're transient, whether they're you know how long they can stay and that kind of thing and that could be that would be established as part of the management plan um and what was there was another question about the liveaboards i would um i think that the uh you know that the purpose of the of the mooring field would allow folks to stay uh overnight on their on their boats if i could perhaps um also ask tim to maybe opine on what the other mooring fields in the area do with regards to full-time or transient and liveaboards or um, most mooring fields have two different classifications. One is a transient and that's usually based on a day rate. Uh, so the person comes in for one day, maybe up to a week. Um, and the transient uh, is very attractive for people that are kind of passing through, uh, taking on uh, uh, provisions and things and possibly, you know, helping um, generate revenue and, and increase visitation to, you know, the various cities, you know, buying groceries and fuel and things. Um, uh, so uh, most mooring fields dedicate a certain number of slips to um, transient uh, spaces, and that's for overnight, or it could be up to two, three nights or up to weeknights. Uh, the other classification is uh, on a monthly rate. And so those moorings are occupied, you know, um, 24 hours, you know, seven days a week. Uh, depending on if the people are using their boat or not, but that's typically what other mooring fields in Florida. Um, that's how that they're 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 managed. Thank you so much. We're gonna go to our next caller, Sean Patrick Bryant. Two minutes. Thanks, Kevin. My name is Sean Patrick Bryant, 16 Island Avenue, Bell Island. Um, I'd like to say that uh, I attended the February 2020 meeting almost two years ago and want to thank Commissioner Ariola for spearheading and bringing that uh, meeting at that time. Um, I've observed the Biscayne Bay for over 19 years from West Avenue neighborhood and now from Bell Isle. On daily walks down the Baywalk, I've seen the Baywalk change from clear water and massive amounts of tropical fish to dark murky water with almost no tropical fish. I've seen the number of vessels in the bay increase from a top number of 25 nice looking sailboats to 150 boats and watercraft, which are derelict. Some of which has, have literally sunk into the bay with their, their gas or diesel, their acid from their batteries and the waste stored upon, um, that was stored on the watercraft. 
The bay has literally become now a parking lot for miscellaneous boats and watercraft as other mooring fields have come online and these vessels have moved over to our area. I've observed people living on boats, urinating into the bay from their boat. I've observed people dumping their human waste into the bay. I'm not against people mooring their sailboats in the bay or living on them. I'm against people mooring the boats that never move from a set point for multiple years. Boats that never move to properly and environmentally dispose of their black water, which is the waste from the toilets, if they aren't moving their boats to the marina to properly dispose of their waste, it's most likely being flushed into the bay. So I support the mooring field that will properly dispose of the black water from each vessel uh, in the mooring field. I've observed boaters dragging their anchors multiple times over large areas damaging the bay floor as they attempt to anchor and catch hold. So I support the mooring field so vessels can secure their boats to these mooring buoys attached to permanent anchors, thus ending damage on the bay floor each time they drag an anchor. So in conclusion, I strongly encourage the city officials to move forward with the establishment of a mooring field in our bay. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. We're gonna to go to Sarah De Los Reyes. Sarah. Hi. Yes. My question, my question is a little bit what Sean said. Number one, those boats are here in Santa Harbor. Some of them haven't moved in four or five years. Is there going to be a length of time in which you're going to let these people keep their boat like permanent here in our in our in our area? And also, how are we going to have a pump out here in Santa Harbor with all the already the pump outs that we have already from the yacht club in the Santa Harbor North Tau, the yacht club that are all connected to the pump out to our own lift station that we manage ourselves and the city doesn't. So how are you going to do that? That to us, that's very important. And also, what about the service vessels that are there with jet skis that they go on and off on that area? Are they going to be part of this, this uh, you know, trial program? They're going to be allowed to do that. And people have done Airbnb and boats there, FYI. The whole thing is really, we've been like living with these boats and growing and growing some of them there. Thank you, sir. The time. I don't want them. I don't want them. I, I, I would do not want somebody to stay there forever. I, I, Is there a time sure frame that you that you know everybody's thinking that a person would stay there in a boat? You know, sure. For yeah. So Sarah, I'm gonna turn over uh, your questions uh, for the time frame. I think it's similar um, to what was mentioned earlier about the management agreement. Um, but Nidia, uh, Nidia and Amy, if you could walk us through um, the, time, the time frame that somebody could live in the mooring field and then also uh, the requirements for the pump out. Sure, I mean, I, I just wanna highlight that it's why it's really important for us to be having this meeting now. So the management plan has not yet been established. And I think that it is up to you know, our community and residents um, to really think about what would be the best sort of rules and regulations. Um, Tim did highlight for us from Tim from Moffat and Nickel that some other mooring fields do have certain transient day rates. They establish different um, monthly um, rates. So I think we would have some ability and um, to really select the options that would work the best. So that will up be all, up to essentially, I think all of us. Um, secondly, you had a concern about pump outs and I just did wanna add that pump out services are required for us to have a mooring field. So that would have to be provided and that folks using the mooring field would have to use those services. Um, absolutely. Um, Nadia and Tim, did you want to add anything? Well, I think there was also a question about behaviors like the jet skis and um, the city um, as part of this process uh, can establish uh, ordinances that are going to um, provide additional uh, tools for regulating the behaviors of, of, of people within the mooring field areas. Um, and then just to, to give you an idea, uh, Dinner Key does have over, uh, their mooring field does have overnight and monthly. Uh, Coconut Grove has monthly and, and daily, um, but there are also some areas that have annual live aboard. So there's a lot for the city to consider um, as they go through this process. Yeah, and I, I would just add that in addition to the, the, the things that we're talking about today, a lot of it still has to be developed and to develop based on the input from the citizens of the city and ultimately our, our 
commissioners that are some of them are participating here and vice mayor as well too will will craft those rules right based on that input from from the community one of the components that was raised also too is enforcement enforcement becomes a very very important component of having a regulated mooring field right so that just like we do enforcement now for jet skis and, uh, and other activities that are not allowed that will be an additional scope that will be added as far as enforcement Thank you, uh, Mr. Sola. So now we're going to go to our next caller. Um, if I just quick reminder, if you're trying to speak and you don't know how to participate, click the raise your hand button. Uh, if you're on a desktop, it'll be at the bottom. If you're on a phone, you need to click the three little dots to go to that menu and then you'll see it. Uh, I ask everyone to please, if you if you do want to speak, uh, raise your hand at this time so we know how many uh, more callers we have. Um, and if you just please, uh, we have two minutes per person and just state your name and address. We're going to go to Martin Skane. Sorry if I mispronounce anybody's name tonight. Oh, it's fine. Hello, uh, I am Martin. I live on the 5555 Collins Avenue. Um, uh, one, I have a few comments here. Uh, first, I am totally in favor of the Morin Field. I think that it's going to help a lot. Uh, one of the comments is uh, the vessels that we are having in Miami, basically, are uh, they are not transit. They are fixed. They are they are there all the time. So uh, the majority of them are not moving at all, or they are they don't have people there. Uh, uh, so well, it, we should target uh, those problems more than the transit. I I think. The other thing is that uh, I agree that uh, this should not become an Airbnb uh, because right now there there is happen is is happening. Um, one of the questions that I have is uh, what kind of vessels are you targeting if it's going to be only sailboats or also motorboats? And uh, my other comment is uh, the dinghy plan for each boat usually cannot scale and creates more problem than benefits. I, I would like to see some, uh, uh, some kind of service there. The other thing that I am seeing is that it uh, will be really good if there could be maybe a, a free pump a service uh, that works because I, I noticed that may, a lot of the pumps are not working, the public pumps. So maybe uh, incentivate in that way could be could help all of this. And uh, the other two things that I have, sorry that is long the list, but uh, I, I am seeing a lot of uh, vessels in uh, in condition of sink of, or with damage. Is any way? or any, any how to denounce them and maybe the city to do a citation and uh, check on security concerns, you know, the, the owners of them, and if not, remove them. And also, if you plan to uh, extend this to Pelican Bay. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, so we have a few uh, questions to get through there. Um, I think we'll start and I'll turn over to Amy. Um, if you could just remind us why we need the program when it comes to the current vessels that we're seeing out there today. Um, and then we'll go through each of his other ones. Sure. I mean, the, the, um, so thank you so much um, for, your, for your comments. The purpose of the mooring field is to stop sort of this unregulated environment um, that you are speaking of. Um, so that is really important. Uh, you spoke about a free pump out service and you know, a pump out service would be would be required as part of the mooring field that would have to be used. Um, you also brought up a lot of concerns about enforcement and that's, that's really important. Uh, we don't have our Marine Patrol on tonight, but I know they work very closely with um, FWC and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll note that for sure. Um, Nadia, did you wanna add? Sure, just to address the, um, the comment about, or the question about the types of vessels, uh, when we do the, the layouts um, uh, of the mooring field and, and how the anchors are arranged, it's really um, based on the depth that, you know, it's based on the swing radius that, um, that Tim had talked about that determines the size and also the depths. So it's not so much um, motor boats versus sailboats as it is. Um, sizes that are that are going to be able to fit in there safely without conflicting um, and then also not damage the bottom. Great, thank you so much. So we're going to go uh, next to Terry Beanstock. Hi there, Mr. Beanstock. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, uh, I'm Terry Beanstock, 2312 
Bay Avenue, Sunset Island 3. I'm on the board of the Sunset Islands 3 and 4 uh, Property Association, and I'm speaking on their behalf. Uh, a, a several points I want to make. One is that we've asked for underlying documentation from the city so we could get a better handle on the issue. We have not been included to date uh, uh, on any of the public forums or meetings. And obviously, we're immediately adjacent to the uh, to the mooring field. I don't know why we were not included, but we were not. And we want to be uh, actively involved in this process. We're, we're not uh, uh, categorically opposed to a mooring field. What we're concerned about is what happens to the boats that do not partake in the mooring field and then move on. We're concerned that they will just move north uh, off our homes uh, between uh, between the Venetians and the Julia Tuttle. What do you think? So first question, what do you think is going to happen to the boats that, you know, the ones out of there now that are unregulated or when they have to start paying and move out, where are they going to go? And then how do we ensure that um, that the the uh, the anchoring limitation area, uh, which nicely, you know, the Venetians appear to take care of themselves as did North Bay Road to some degree, but we have not because we were we didn't know about this. You know, they got into the state legislation. How do we get into the state legislation or the county legislation to make sure entering uh, of the of unregulated boats uh, does not just uh, move off offshore from our homes? The second issue I want to ask is we've asked for documentation. We've been promised, uh, we asked back in November, we've been promised that it was going to be forthcoming and we have not seen a, a, a piece of paper. We'd like to get an idea of what the experience, not only what has been recommended by your own boards, which we understand is a much smaller uh, mooring field than you guys are proposing. Uh, and we want to understand that aspect. But we also would like to know what the uh, experience has been uh, in pros and cons of mooring fields that have been established in Coconut Grove, in Key Biscayne, in, in Sarasota, and, and you know, these other areas, what the experiences have been. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beanstalk. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Amy um, to go over uh, maybe some of the meetings that have taken place. I know uh, this is our second uh, virtual public meeting. Um, and then also you can maybe walk us through what's to come in terms of the public process. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at that. So, um, you know, just welcome, I would say, Mr. Beanstalk, at this moment in time, it's a very good time for you to be involved. Um, there was a meeting held back in February of 2020, I believe with Sunset Harbor neighborhood. I wasn't personally involved at that time, but with this meeting, we did make sure to cast this invite citywide so that um, as many people could participate as possible. Um, your second question is what happens to the unregulated boats? Where will they move? Um, I did have a slide where we introduced a new state statute that allows Miami-Dade County to establish um, specific anchoring limitation areas. Uh, we think that's very encouraging. And as the uh, we move to the next steps, it's gonna be important to have a full plan that we um, can, through different uh, channels and waterway markers and anchoring limitation areas, seek to minimize any um, potential issues that could get moved off to other areas. So um, we can send that statute to you uh, we would need to work closely with the county with that, and that would have to be part of our plan. And uh, it's noted that you have a, a concern with uh, with where you live, and we're going to have to get some more specific information and probably work directly with your um, association. Um, third, you talked about information. I, I really, we, we sent you some information, Mr. Beanstalk, about sanitary sewer breaks and our responses to that. We sent you the official responses to Durham. Um, and you also asked for some specific uh, water quality data, and we explained that it is all in raw form. And once it is analyzed, we can share that to you. If there's something else that we can provide, please um, communicate with Kevin and myself, and we'll try to get that to you. Um, and I think, Nadia, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think you covered a lot of it. Um, I think one of the other um, items that was brought up was wanting to an understanding of what have been some of the benefits and, and drawbacks of some of the other mooring fields and and um, certainly through discussions with um, the other mooring fields um, they have um, in some cases um, you know they have reduced the, um, the unregulated mooring activities 
Uh, they've allowed the, um, you know, when, when some of these um, marinas are actually trying to make money, they're allowed, they're able to um, put the, the, the moorings in ways that are, um, you know, providing revenue um, in areas where it's for the cities and that kind of thing um, that are public where they're not so interested in the revenue. There's a lot of environmental benefits that have been associated with that. I recall a couple of years ago, uh, at the, uh, the last public meeting, there were concerns brought up about uh, the pump outs being broken at, at several of these mooring facilities. Um, and I contacted all the ones in South Florida and they were actually working. Um, so I did, you know, the boats are utilizing those. Thank you so much. So we're gonna go to our next uh, caller, Gail Durham, if you could state your name and address. Uh, and as we go on, uh, we may go down to one minute per person, but we'll continue right now at two. Um, as we get closer to 730. So Gail. Oh, hi there. Time. My name is Gail Durham. I live at 1455 West Nav. And I just had to, uh, wanted to make two points that our neighborhood would like to have input on the management agreement. Um, and also we hope the city uh, takes suggestions from the city's Marine and Water Committee because a lot of good people are on that committee. And my second point is um, well, you know, I'm really appreciative of the city's moving forward and thank you, Commissioner Ariola, for getting the ball uh, rolling and started. Uh, but the one thing I've seen at this presentation that's a little concerning is the phasing of the mooring field. Because as you phase from Sunset Harbor South, that would actually push the boats into unfazed areas. Uh, so I guess my preference would be that it's not phased. And um, if that's not possible, then is there some kind of way to maybe the first phase be really, really spread out so you really take over the area uh, so we don't have that problem? Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Gail. And we'll be sure to include you uh, uh, throughout the public process. So I'm going to turn to Nydia and Amy, if you can maybe briefly uh, discuss phasing approaches. Sure. I mean, from at least from my perspective, I think what Nadia shared is um, that we have options and we have options as a city and options as a community. Um, there's not one that's been decided on completely yet. And I think there's pros and cons of the different approaches. Um, but I think I think we can take your comments into consideration. Um, I did want to mention that this item um, should be going to our city commission soon, um, hopefully to our finance committee as soon as we get a date um, this January as well. Thank you. So we're going to go to the next uh, caller, Santiago, if you could say your full name and address. Hi, sorry, I had to unmute myself. Hi, this is Santiago Alvarado. My address is 3 Island Avenue. And I just want to build on some of the points that some of the other people have made. I would urge you to move forward with this project as soon as possible. I have, even though my area maybe in the first phase, I had the same concerns that Gail just had, that if we move this too slowly, all we're gonna do is basically bunch of, a bunch of boats further and further up and destroy uh, the, the habitats for other parts of our bay. Um, the other thing that isn't, um, you know, the other thing I, I wanna remind everyone that's here on this meeting is that the majority of these people that have uh, these boats anchored off of our off of our bay in our bay are not city residents. They pay no city taxes, but they inflict a lot of punishment in terms of our bay, uh, the ecosystem that we live in, and our community. So. Uh, I'm not sure what is the place that you're looking at at permitting for both the purposes of the docking, but also I want to see permitting and also paying for uh, any transportation or, or any extra city services that we're going to have to pay out for, including the pump outs, the transportation, things like that. And I highly recommend this idea because as a resident of Three Island Avenue, I was president of the board during Irma, and we had one of these boats that basically was un became unanchored, 
there, the people that lived there moved off the boat and the boat basically destroyed our dock. And it took us $200,000 in two years to get the Durham permits and be able to re to basically bring back our, uh, our sun deck. Thank, thank you, Santiago. I'm sorry, uh, time uh, just elapsed and I do wanna make sure we could comment on some of your questions there. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over um, to the team um, to help with that one. So um, I'll jump in, Kevin, a couple of things. Um, I think uh, one of the concerns that was brought up was about the phasing and Kevin, would it be okay to get those slides back up? Sure. So we could talk a little bit about that. Um, and then while you're doing that, I did want to mention um, in response to what Gail had said that uh, just so you know that we have involved uh, the Marine and Waterway Committee uh, and did meet with those, those folks as well uh, separately. So, um, so basically we put this, this together um, as a place to start, right? Um, based on feedback from Marine Patrol, uh, where the navigational channels are, um, and where the moorings are. And the city um, is, you know, appreciates your input at this point to um, how they're gonna phase the project. Um, the city can do multiple phases. Um, they can permit it all at once and they construct it, they can construct it as individually. Um, they can um, permit one phase or multiple phases at a time. Um, and then and then construct as they need. Um, so some of the benefits, uh, I think some of the concerns that you're ex expressing are, you know, boat movement uh, and what Amy was talking about with the, um, the, uh, the legislation um, being done in, you know, uh, to establish anchorage limitation areas in conjunction with the mooring field. Uh, the goal of, of, of that two-prong approach is to try to address some of that concern associated with the boat spread. Thank you. Um, so I'm not sure uh, if anybody wanted to add on to that, but I'm going to go just, to our I next. just want to make sure that we understand that the phasing is, is one specific to, to, a, to a particular area, whatever area we ultimately choose, right? But once the rules are, are, are approved by the commission, it, it, they're in place. It, 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 the, the whole purpose of having the mooring field is not to displace voters. If, if there's only X number of, of mooring balls, and that's it. That's the only location. So we're not trying to push the derelict boats from one area to the other. At that point, the enforcement takes over and the folks that don't have a mooring ball are going to have to go someplace else, not within the city of Miami Beach. Great. Thank you, Mr. Sola. So now we're going to go to Jose. If you could say your full name and address. Hi, my name is Jose. I live in uh, Nine Island Avenue. And I have a uh... I have a couple of questions. Uh, one is if the mooring fields are established, will the Malloy Tan on front of Bell Isle and parallel to West Avenue then be made a no wake zone or a minimum wake zone? Two, will the moorings uh, be able to withstand tropical storm or hurricane storm winds to avoid vessels drifting into our properties and docks, damaging the docks and seawalls? And three, what enforcement will there be uh, an inspection of the pump outs and making sure the boats have those valves closed. What setbacks will the fields have from our properties? And uh, will the moorings have a time limit, perhaps be short term only? Thank you, Jose, for those concise questions. We super appreciate it. Um, so now we're going to, um, I think for the first two questions, before I turn it over uh, to the, or the last two at least, the setbacks and the time limits, again, that's going to be dictated by the management agreement, um, and that's yet to come, uh, and there's going to be a process for that. Um, so Nidia or Tim, uh, if you could maybe walk us through uh, the wake zones surrounding, uh, as well as uh, hurricanes and tropical storm conditions. Sure. Um, as part of the permitting process through the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, FWC, the managed mooring field would in fact be a no wake zone. Um, during the permitting process uh, and feedback from the city in meetings like this, the team may look at uh, expanding that no wake or, or minimum wake or a speed zone. We can look at a five mile an hour type uh, 
speed zone and see how that overlays with the existing manatee zones uh, in the area. So that is a possibility, but the area in the mooring field and, and a reasonable buffer would be permitted as a uh, no wake zone. We can't have boats and jet skis and other vessels, you know, running through uh, the, uh, the mooring field. Uh, your question on the tropical storm, uh, most mooring fields are designed to anchor the, the boat safely up to kind of a, a threshold category one uh, hurricane or right up to that to that point, about 75 to 80 mile an hour winds. Um, anything more than that, the um, the management plan would require the vessels to not be uh, in the mooring field in a, in, a, in a storm, you know, much past uh, just the category one storm. I think I think we. Is any other question we didn't address there in his list of questions? I think we got them all. Um, and again, the setbacks that goes back uh, go as we move through this process. We'll know the exact parameters uh, and then the uh, time limit and time duration that the vessels will be there. Yes, about short-term vessels. Uh, again, that's all within the managing documents. Uh, so now we're going to go next to Scott Diffenderfer. Hi, I'm Scott Diffendorfer. I live at Nine Island Avenue on Bell Isle. And I just wanted to thank everybody involved in this. I know this is a, a thing that we've been discussing uh, among our neighbors for many, many years. And I know that wholeheartedly most of them are very happy to see this going forward. I have a couple questions. Um, you know, this seems to be, it's going to take a long time with all this permitting. And I just, two things that I really wonder about, is there any such thing as enforcement of ticketing and of, of unseaworthy vessels? And if so, who is responsible for doing that? Because clearly these boats are, I mean, they, they're like the demolition derby version of boats. They're just, you can clearly see they're not functioning. They're, some of them are sinking. And my second question is, uh, I was walking down Dade Boulevard the other day. I've always noticed that cut in the seawall across from Publix. And, you know, I went down there and looked and there were like 12, dinghies that again were just in terrible condition and there's no no docking signs up there and yet that's clearly we why did the city make it easy for these people to go to Publix and and dock their boats there there's no enforcement of that um so that's my question I just uh you know I know this is a great idea but in the meantime we, we have like absolutely seem to have no enforcement of anything and I just wanted to see if someone would address that um, thank, thank you, Scott. So I'm going to turn it over um, to the team so that they could uh, address that. Sure. On the enforcement, the Marine Patrol, uh, the city of Miami Beach has their own Marine Patrol. And then obviously, um, there's a couple of other agencies that have jurisdiction. Uh, FWC has their own Marine Patrol. And then of course, the county uh, has Marine Patrol boats, they have the ability to um, board any vessel um, for safety reasons and, and safety inspections if there's if there's you know if they see it sinking listing um, uh, you know, sewage or fuel or something they have the right to and I, and I believe the city has a very active program where they put notices on the boats of, of safety violations um, and obviously all vessels that are anchored have to be registered uh, registered vessels, you know, with with uh, up to date registrations. Uh, the problem is that a lot of the boats, as you probably know, out there don't have any registrations, and they they have they have to go through a formal notification process before they turn them over into the uh, derelict vessel uh, program. So I think the challenge is that you know a lot of the vessels out there aren't properly registered, and trying to track down the registrations and documentation is is a very difficult and time consuming process. Thank you, Tim. And we actually have um, the captain of our Marine, Marine Patrol, uh, uh, Captain Ian Robinson is on. So I just wanted to check in if there's anything you wanted to add to that, Captain Robinson. Uh, no, what the, uh, good evening. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, what the gentleman stated a minute ago is, is fairly accurate and good evening, Scott. Um, so yes, uh, there is a process called the derelict vessel process. And as you stated, uh, there's, we send a certified mail to the owner, try to get a hold of the owner. Um, there are certain criteria that have to be met. Uh, does it have its own means of propulsion? Does it have lighting and all that? So that unfortunately doesn't happen overnight. Uh, I could probably count 25 boats right now that I wish I can just, we wish that we can just hook up to the back of our boat and take so we never see them again. 
uh, but there's a statue in place that we have to go through the motions. And we're pretty successful at that. I know it doesn't seem like we're making a dent, uh, but I would say probably one, maybe two every two weeks um, is our is our goal um, for that. So we're, we're chipping away at it. It doesn't happen overnight. It's probably about a, a month long process to get it in the database where it's called derelict and then find a vendor to take it away and destroy it and all that. Um, the second part of your question, Scott, that little dock that um, where all those dinghies are that, uh, in my opinion, totally block that Dade Canal over there um, is an issue that, um, that, that, that has to be addressed by um, the city commission at some point. The signage over there, although it says uh, no docking or whatever, it's confusing to us too. There needs to be something cut and dry that says, okay, if there's a boat here to be used, uh, you're going shopping at Publix or whatever, okay, this boat can only stay here for 20 minutes, an hour. We would come by and mark it uh, some way, shape, or form indescriptly, and then come back, you know, two hours later. And if that boat's still there, it would give us the authority to tow it away. So I'm not going to lie; um, it is an issue. It has that canal completely blocked uh, at some times, and there's people that have their dings there and have left them there for months at a time. Um, and by the way, that doesn't fall under the derelict vessel thing. That's a whole, a whole other thing. So that that issue should be addressed by the the city commission. Thank you so much, Captain Robinson, uh, for stepping in and helping us with that. Uh, we're going to go next to Lori. If I could ask everybody if we could just have our questions or comments uh, quickly. I think we're going to go down to one minute per person. So again, one minute per person. Um, and for your questions and comments, Lori? How do I unmute? Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Lori, 1300 Biscaya Drive. I'm at Surfside. I face Stillwater. And I want to bring to the City Mine Beach's attention. I appreciate very much that you're having this uh, forum. And I ditto everything that everyone's being said down in the Sunset Harbor area. We've had this problem up in the um, northern end of your city um, at Stillwater. And I just want to make aware that once the Bell Harbor sandbar area begins their dredging, those boats are going to head towards the northern end of Stillwater. We are suffering here with the um, sea life that is deteriorating, just like uh, many of you have mentioned. And we'd like to raise our hand and please don't forget the north end of Miami Beach and establish a mooring field in this area as the seagrass is just totally being desecrated. And I just wanna make that comment to please remember us on the north end of Miami Beach. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori, and thank you for joining this evening. And again, this is gonna be a citywide uh, mooring field. Uh, so that's important to note that uh, this, this will have also effects in North Beach. So again, we're gonna go one minute per person. If you could say just your full name and address, uh, Cooper. My name is Ruth Cooper. We're at 1800 Purdy Avenue. We also own a slip at Sunset Harbor Yacht Club. We were at the February 10th, 2020 meeting. It has been two years since that proposal. I don't see that anything, anything has been done. You are stating that you need to establish a need to the commission. How is it? that in two years that you have the same exact proposal that you had two years ago and you have not yet established a need. Um, I would like to know which of our city commissioners are on board and which are not on board. Please tell us which ones we need to get on board. And lastly, I see now that you have pushed the permitting time from 2022 to 2024. I would like to know what that means in real life. When, if ever, is this coming to fruition to get a mooring field if the permitting doesn't even start till 2022? 24. Thank, thank you, uh, Ms. Cooper. Um, so uh, I, I'll, you know, and I'll speak on, on behalf of the administration, right? So this, this is, and I know it appears that, that it's slow, but there's a lot of agencies involved in, in getting this mooring field up and going. There has been a lot of work that has taken place. We, the purpose of tonight is to tell you 
where we're at and the additional work that, that yet remains, right? So, but the, the project is part of our capital program. The project is moving forward and we have no intentions of, of stopping, you know, stopping the project. In, in fact, the, the purpose of tonight is to get input as to potentially location, upland facilities, and, and how do we move forward with bringing legislation to the commission that would establish the rules. Thank you, Mr. Solar. So we're gonna go next to George Linderman. If you could just state your full name and address, uh, one minute. My name is George Linderman. I live at 2300 uh, Bay Avenue. I'm part of the Sunset Islands. We were not advised. That's why I was not at the last meeting. Uh, Mr. Sola suggested that once the mooring field is established that the boats at Purdy will not move north to us there's nothing I heard in this meeting that concurs with that. These new regulations might work, might not. Dade County might allow it, might not. Two questions. Can you assure us that you will not move forward with the mooring field unless you have a way to prevent the boats in Purdy at solving that horrific problem, but creating another one somewhere else? That's question one. Question two, the management. Can you please assure us tonight that whoever's managing this will not be involved in alcohol in any way, will not have an alcohol license, and that that type of uh, um, management will not be allowed for this mooring field. Thank, thank you, Mr. Linderman. Um, so I'm going to jump over to the staff. So, let, let me give you, just give you a quick, quick answers there. With regard, I'll take them in reverse order. With regards to, to alcohol, we have, we have never had any conversations internally as to what, what kind of of alcohol is going to be involved or, or even food and beverage, right? Everything's been focused on the upland facilities and the designation of the, the mooring field, right? So, you know, so whether there is additional facilities, whether it be laundry, fuel or anything like that, again, those are things that are, that are on the board, but we have not decided. Uh, ultimately, the legislation that the, that the commission will approve will establish those rules with regards to enforcement, okay? And, and as far as interaction with other governmental agencies, the county being one of them, we, we have not received any insight or any information that the county is opposed to having a mooring field. In fact, the, the Miami Dade County has several mooring fields already established. The, the step in order to control the, the unregulated boats surrounding Miami Beach, the first step is to establish a mooring field. Establishing a mooring field then allows us to have an enforcement policy that will require boats that are not in a mooring ball will have to find someplace else to go. And ideally not in Miami Beach. So this is not just about establishing the mooring field, but also the rules and the enforcement to ensure that derelict boats and other boats that are not part of the mooring field do not just move to another location in Miami Beach. Thank you. We're going to go to username uh, Bentley Bay, I believe. If you could say your full name and address. Good evening, this is Tim Carr, 540 West Avenue. Again, I agree with many of the comments tonight. Uh, in particular, I like the aerial graph that you showed earlier today. I noticed on the south side of Bell Island, 2018, there's about 43 slips. As of today, from where I live, looking up the bay towards Bell Island, I can count almost 65 slips that are mostly all derelict. So again, the more we can activate this process. And again, I would encourage to do it across all areas, perhaps increase the density later to have an impact to really help impact this area as best as possible. Also, um, the other lady talked about the sense of urgency. We've all seen the, the bay decline rapidly in the last several years. So there is a real sense of urgency. I realize the permitting process of the agencies, but again, if we could really make this a top priority because the bay, unfortunately, doesn't have the time that it needs to really survive with what's going on right now. So again, appreciate everyone's participation in this presentation tonight. Thank you, Mr. Carr. We're gonna go to uh, username is Michael Grounds. Grounds, you can state your full name and address. Oops. Yeah, my name is Michael Grouse. I live at 16 Island Avenue in Bell um, I'm very supportive of establishing the mooring field as uh, everyone has outlined. There's just myriad benefits to it. So there's really no question in my mind in that regard. I guess the specific question I have centers around moving forward because regrettably it does seem that the conversation we're having tonight is 
very similar to one that we had one and two years ago. And so I want to know what the tangible next steps are to actually move forward from a generic process that's been outlined again tonight to a specific one for Miami Beach. Do we have to have consensus on the commission? Do they need to have a vote of some fashion? Does there need to be financing garnered? There's grants available, but even if grants aren't found, I think the city just needs to spend the money. So what are the tangible next steps? What are the barriers to moving forward in an expeditious way? Thank you, Michael. Um, that's a that's a great question. I'm gonna actually, let's table that to, uh, to close and we could go over next steps. So that way we can make sure we answer everybody's question quickly. Uh, so one minute, Michael. Keely. There we go. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Outstanding. My name is Mike Kiley. I'm a resident at 650 West Avenue. Uh, I'm also a yacht broker for Denison Yachting at Miami Beach Marina. So there's a, a few things that uh, questions I have, and I can make it quick. So the adjacent channel to the actual mooring field the North-South Channel. Uh, I'm not sure if that has to go through the U.S. Coast Guard or whether that, that can be done through the city, but that should be a new wake channel. It would be very unsafe. There's a lot of large yacht traffic uh, that pushes a lot of large wake. Uh, that would make it very unsafe for the people in the mooring field. Uh, it might even solve the jet ski problem. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious to see how that decision is made, but I think that should be a new wake, a no wake zone. Uh, secondary, I'm sure in your contract or whatever contract we might have for the mooring field, when it is developed, has a hurricane plan. Um, and it's all about the liability. And would the city have liability if a boat that has a, um, if a boat that has a substandard line connected to that mooring, if that does break loose and let's just say damages, uh, like the past gentleman said, a dock, other boats. Um, are we liable for that? And Thank you. I'm going to jump. Sorry, sir. I'm going to jump to Tim. If you could walk us through or Nydia uh, in your prior experience on the liability uh, question. And then um, as for the wake zone, I, I think, again, that's going to be developed through the process. Is that right? Correct. The no wake zone would be, you know, part of the management plan. We'd be looking at the adjacent channels and, you know, expanding the no wake zones. Obviously, the the polygon of the actual managed mooring field would be a no wake zone. But as you said, you mentioned, there there may be a requirement or a need for additional to expand that that no wake area. Um, regarding the substandard line, typically the the city would be responsible for the anchor and the um, and what's called a pendant. Uh, and then where the vessel connects to the pendant, that's actually the vessel's responsibility. Generally, the marina manager is, 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 is responsible for verifying that um, all of those uh, components, you know, meet the minimum requirements for the design wind speeds, the wave conditions, and things like that. Uh, the, as part of the management plan, the city would have to do periodic inspections, you know, of the anchors, the down lines, the mooring balls and components to avoid uh, those types of, of issues. Um, most mooring fields, as I mentioned earlier, uh, right at about the uh, threshold of the category one hurricane, 74, 75, 80 mile an hour winds, our, the requirement is to be evacuated because they can't, this, this is pretty open water. It's not a protected area and it would not be safe for the vessels to remain out there. And it would not be cost effective to design the moorings for those large storm events. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to our next caller, uh, M. Canales, I believe. If you could state your full name and address, one minute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can you, yeah, uh, my name is Mark Canales at uh, 1228 West Avenue. Uh, yes, I, I hear everybody's comments about this mooring field and so far, and I am a boater myself, and I actually do have a boat out there. I have a 42 foot boat. Uh, one of my first comments would be that most mooring fields do not accept the 42 foot boat. They're too big. So I would be excluded from this mooring field. I also like to point out that there's probably about 150 boats. I boat through this area all the time. There's probably 150 boats out there, 70% of which are unoccupied. And many of those are derelict boats. So if we can get rid of all the derelict boats that present a hazard to other boats and so forth, that would be great pro 
progress. There would be no need for mooring fuel. Of the 30% that are occupied, if we could provide them with a pump out boat, again, there would be no need for a mooring fuel. My boat itself, it's anchored with three separate anchors in a Y format. Therefore, there is hardly any damage to the seagrass because the Y format prevents the chains from rolling around the bed as the boat circles around. So that does not happen. Uh, I Thank you so much. We went a bit over, um, tried to give you a, few, a little bit of extra time. We're gonna go next to Raul Ketkar. Yeah, hey guys, this is hey Raul Ketkar. I'm at 540 West Avenue. Just a couple questions. Um, I do see this as, as two distinct problems, right? The first is enforcement and the second is infrastructure. So on the enforcement side, just curious, how is the Bay currently regulated and how are the rules enforced today? And then importantly, how this change with the mooring field? And then also, why can't we just update the regulations now and enforce uh, this today? And the second piece on infrastructure, where will the mooring field be located? We saw on that one slide is red, blue, yellow, green. Is the idea it would be across all four sections or just one of those sections? That would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn that uh, over to the team real quick, if they could. I know we answered enforcement uh, once or twice. Right. On the enforcement issue, as, as the captain of the Marine Patrol mentioned, they can only enforce the unregulated anchorage if you have a managed mooring field. So until you have a managed mooring field, they, they're, they're limited on the ability to enforce, with the exception of the safety, the derelict vessels, and some of the ongoing processes. Uh, your second question about where the mooring field will be located, uh, what the graphic you saw this evening were, were potential phases and polygons uh, that the city is considering, you know, the feedback, whether the, whether the mooring field will be further to the north around the Venetian Causeway or further to the south towards the Fifth Street Bridge. Those are all you know, discussions uh, that are ongoing relative to phasing. Thank you so much. So if we could take our last final comments, uh, one minute, GG Miami Beach, if you could state your name and address. Yes, hi, thank you, GG uh, Miami, uh, James Derby, Miami Beach, uh, 1700 Purdy. Um, I only hear comments that are negative toward getting a mooring field when all of our ancestors came by boat. <laughs> we, uh, you know, when COVID broke out, the, the, the marine life came back People were still out living on their boats out there, but the marine life came back due to COVID and due to inactivity on the water. Uh, whenever it rains and floods, the streets have been raised and the sewage goes right into the bay from home sewages. People laying in their ivory towers looking down at boats. These are people who work and, and have livings and, and do things out here. I wasn't really prepared for this um, speech that I'm trying to give, but I'm definitely opposed to it. Um, it's an active cruising place. I don't know the oxymoron that's uh, underwater land rights. I don't know where that comes from. It's just a bay. And uh, in 1963, 35,000 elephants died in uh, Savo National Park in Kenya because of uh, humans uh, inv invading on their habitat. They built houses and built roads and things like this. And 35,000 elephants died because of stress and density. And what this is causing everyone on the water is just stress and density, you know. Thank you so much. I apologize. Um, we just we have uh, one more caller that I want to make sure we're able to. Uh, we have one minute. Uh, Fabian Bassan. Hi, everybody. Um, so my initial question was actually asked before regarding the enforcement. I'm very curious to see what laws um, currently exist and what we can do to better enforce them. Uh, secondly, I'm looking forward to understanding and reading over the language of the management company contract and would be interested to know how soon that would even a draft would be available, even if it's a work in progress, to get the input of the community. Um, and the last bit that I just wanted to bring to your attention um, is that I just wanted to make sure that there is something in that management contract that... Uh, confirms for the long haul that this would not later be turned into something else if it doesn't work as the more proposed mooring, um, that it wouldn't eventually lead to some sort of a commercial marina project. Um, 
in that area in front of uh, Belle Isle um, or Sunset Harbor. Well, there's already one there, but I guess on the other side by Belle Isle. Uh, that's Thank it. Thank you so much, um, uh, Fabian. So um, with that, I think we, we answered some of those questions, uh, again, for the management agreement, that's gonna go through its process. So it's important that you stated um, your comments now that they could be incorporated as that comes up. Um, now, I, I do wanna close, if we could close, Amy, with uh, the tangible next steps that I think Michael asked earlier. Um, so we could discuss what the next community uh, outreach steps and input are, and then if we could, if you guys could give us some closing remarks. Sure, Kevin, we actually addressed that during the presentation. There's a slide that actually has the next steps. So if you want to bring that up, we can, we can review those. Um, so the city did receive funding um, in November of 2021. We received grant funding to proceed with the design and permitting. Um, so at this point, the next step is to obtain consensus on the location from our city commission. So it's going to both our finance committee and our city commission, where we will be making um, recommendations from the administration's perspective um, and we'll, based on feedback, and we will work with the city commission on uh, what the phasing will be. That will actually, or the actual geographic location, um, whether it's approach with all four areas, whether it's start with um, area one or area four, and really make that decision as to the next steps. At that point, the design and permitting um, can happen. Um, it can't really happen until we have that specific information. The design and permitting takes about two to two and a half years. Um, I expect that we would have a significant uh, amount of, of um, opportunities to participate. Um, we do have a website that has a lot of information from the preliminary analysis to the state statute. And I think there's gonna be many um, opportunities for people to, to definitely get engaged. Um, all of these things are gonna have to go through our city commission and through our commission process. Um, so we, we think that there'll be a lot of opportunities. Um, after the design and permitting, we are gonna have to continue to seek more funding. Um, I believe that there are grant funding opportunities available. We have a list of those that we will pursue, but we can't do that until we get into the design and permitting. And there'll be needs, uh, there will need to be some additional funding um, from the city as well through our budget process. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, so with that, I just wanna thank everybody for participating this evening. Uh, we apologize if you weren't able to answer, ask a question this evening, if you could email me at kevinpolito at miamibeachfl.gov. This presentation along with the PowerPoint will be online tomorrow uh, on the website uh, that's listed there. Um, again, we wanna thank our commissioners and vice mayor that stayed on this evening. Um, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us via the website. Thank you everybody and have a great evening.